Well, it is, uh, it's great to be here, uh, to be here with you. There's no better place that I would rather be than right here opening up God's Word today. It's His inerrant Word as well that we're opening up. That's a great thought. He can even open up His Word to our minds. Uh, we'll be uh, going through a series I call Explorations in Genesis. We'll be examining some of the more troubling passages over the next few weeks. And as I mentioned last week, I've longed to preach this series because of the background that I have in the sciences. Um, I recognize also that there are a lot of people that get stumped sometimes by um, what I think are relatively easy biblical answers. And... Um, I fear that because evolution has been taught almost as fact that we really have lost two generations of people who no longer have a, a real foundation in the Bible and who are fearful uh, about trying to answer questions that have to do with just a tiny bit of science, not a whole lot of science. Questions like... Um, how do the dinosaurs fit into the creationist view? Okay, how many of you are going to admit that you've already asked me about that? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, what about where did, uh, where did Cain's wife come from? Abel's wife, where did it come from? Where did Seth's wife come from? What about that? Or can anyone genuinely hold to a six-day, 24-hour creation view? Can't the word... Yom in Hebrew, which is the word for day. Can't the word yom mean era or epic? And if it does, then doesn't that allow for huge amounts of time so that the biblical record could allow for evolution? Um, how about how did all the animals fit on Noah's ark? How could they possibly have fit on Noah's ark? Um, can't I believe in evolution and still believe in God? You can. You can. You'll be incorrect. <laughs> can't I be a theistic evolutionist? That's an oxymoron. Let's say it the other way. You're an atheistic creationist. That doesn't work, does it? All I can say to you is that these answers, many, many more answers, are in the Bible, and they're essentially in the book of Genesis. And so um, we're going to be doing maybe what, what, what can be called creation evangelism, a strengthening you so that you can answer others when they have relatively simple questions. I remember talking to my future wife at the time, Peg, and saying, you don't have to throw out your brain to become a Christian. And she loved that. And I said, well, that's actually the name of a book that I read, so <laughs> I didn't think it up. You know. uh, do you believe in a supernatural God? That's one thing you have to ask yourself. Today, we have many religions, many cults, who have created a perfectly rational God that everybody can understand. And I always say to them, I don't need your God. I need a God that's bigger than me, smarter than me, that I can't understand. And creation should convince us of that, that at least the intelligent designer behind is indeed that. Only God is the answer. But we really haven't studied our Bibles the way we should. Uh, we have more Bibles in the United States, in our homes, than ever before, and they are just not getting read. At least they're not getting read maybe more than once. Um, I'm approaching the topics that we'll be dealing with this week and last week and in the next several weeks from a young earth creationist viewpoint. I'll try my best to swing you over to my side, which is the light side. <laughs> um, if you don't agree with me, 
you don't have to agree with me, just bring it on. Let's, let's talk it through. Um, Genesis, the word itself, let me give a little bit of overview for you. The, the word itself means origin. And so it's a book of origins, and Genesis is absolutely that. And it's not just man's origin at all. Um, this information, incidentally, comes from a, kind of a, a little bit of a textbook called The Genesis Record by Henry Morris. And Henry Morris, um, no longer with us, but his son is also now the head of the organization that he started called Creation Research Institute there in San Diego. I had the opportunity to speak with him and hear him preach on several occasions since when I became a Christian, I was down in the San Diego area, I would frequent the Creation Research Institute. Um, he was a hydrogeologist by trade. Uh, and he wrote the book, uh, The Genesis Record, which is more of a devotional approach. He actually has a really good textbook that he wrote with John C. Whitcomb called The Genesis Flood. And that was more down his alley. But here are some of the origins that you'll find really in the book of Genesis. Uh, origin of the universe. Origin of order and complexity. Origin of the solar system. Origin of the atmosphere and the hydrosphere. Origin of life. Origin of man. Origin of marriage. How about the origin of uh, evil? That's there too. Origin of uh, language, of government, of culture, of nations, of religion, of God's people. That's why the Bible, and specifically Genesis, are foundational actually for our salvation as well as for our understanding of the world that we live in. You will not have a very strong Christian worldview without a proper understanding of the book of Genesis. Also, that's why our culture attacks Genesis and the Bible. When you think about our culture today and the attacks that come, they come in the form of homosexuality, transgenderism, abortion, egalitarianism, pornography, morality, racism, euthanasia, marriage and divorce. But those are all attacks against the foundational truth of Scripture itself. It's really not an issue whether I think Bob and Mike can have a relationship together. The problem is they want me to say it's scriptural. The problem is it's foundational to Christian world view. God created male and female. This week, uh, Brown University uh, decided to put tampons in the men's room. That's an assault on common sense. That's also an assault on scripture. The quote said, it's not just women that menstruate anymore. No, you should all be guffawing. <laughs> Except those of you that send your children to Brown University. Now, you want to know how far our cultures come it was Roger Williams who founded that state. And anybody know the location of Brown University? It happens to be in Providence. Providence, named, of course, after God's providence. That's how far we've come. Um, if 
my foundation is scripture and Genesis. What's their foundation? It's called secular humanism. Man as God. Man as determiner. So now let's look a little more deeply into the organization of Genesis. And as we do, let's, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, take this time, would you, and allow me to be um, clear. Allow it to uh, allow the message to um, strengthen our convictions and embolden us. Uh, help us, Lord, to show others that um, they're going around like the emperor without any clothes. Help us to ask uh, genuine questions so that people can see the God around them. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, um, Genesis is a book of organizations and generations as well. I'm not surprising any of you if I tell you that it's a book of generations, am I? And, and that, incidentally, is a, um, it's a Hebrew word, toledoth. Toledoth, the Hebrew word, means generations. And uh, some time ago, a Bible scholar sat down and recognized that there was a bit of a pattern going on in Genesis and so he said, every time I see this word Toledoth generations, it, it looks like it's introducing another section of Genesis. So you can just look along with me here, but when that word Toledoth, it's talking about the generation of the heavens and the earth in 2.4. But the next time we see it is in 5.1, and it's talking about the generations of Adam. 6.9 talking about the generations of Noah. That's after the flood. Uh, then in 10.1, talking about his sons. In 11.1, it's not talking about the sons, it's talking about Shem now. And that's the father of the Semitic race. That's where we get that from, Shem and the Semitic race. And then Toledoth occurs again in 11.27, the generations of Terah. And Terah was the father of Abraham, who was called out of Abraham of the Chaldees as a pagan and became representative of the people called God's people. Next was uh, Ishmael in 2512, born to Abraham through Hagar, and he would become the father of the entire Arab race. Then Isaac, in 2519, uh, he was the child of the promise. And then Esau twice, in 36.1 and 36.9. And then finally, Jacob, in uh, 37.12. So this is kind of the breakdown. It was probably a very easy uh, Jewish way of remembering the patriarchal lineage. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first two chapters, Genesis 1 and chapter 2, and I'm not going to comment until we get to chapter 2, hoping that you'll actually still remember some of the things that I said last week in chapter 1. So you should be able to follow along in your Bibles or behind me here. And uh, let's go ahead then to chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And I mentioned last week, this starts out, Bereshith Barach Elohim, which is, in the beginning, God. And, and that's all you can say about creation. In the beginning, God. God was there. God did it. God is. God always was. Incidentally, um, some of you were in here when we play, played a five-minute clip. Uh, you maybe it was it was kind of noisy at the beginning. He gave his intro, and his intro was that he was went went to MIT and got his doctorate there, and then taught there. Now he's over in Israel. He deals with nuclear stuff, and um, he proved the existence of God which is pretty cool. Uh, maybe next week you'll come in here a little bit earlier and take some notes. 
But that's what he did. I'll leave it up for next week. It'll be there. And uh, it was cool. He's a physicist guy, and he, he said it, it can be done. Uh, so, in the beginning, God. And uh, that's all you need to know. It, it, today, when folks attack Scripture, I see it as um, me wanting to tell them, my dad is bigger than your dad. <laughs> Verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. So just a little explanation there. God is commanding the waters to relocate here, and he's shifting them high and low, and he creates an expanse in the middle that's called the heavens. Presumably at this point, then he is creating a canopy of gases that will shield the earth. They are over the earth from harmful rays, making it really an ideal biosphere. There is no bad UV light getting through. There are only good and great wavelengths getting through. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear and it was so, God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together. He called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind, on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kind, and trees bearing fruit in their kind in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth and it was so, and God made the two great lights, the great light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars, and God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the dark, and God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. Now I've highlighted the phrase according to their kind because evolution postulates that Different kinds come from similar kinds. And we have no evidence for that. We have no fossil record. It's a hypothesis. It's always been a hypothesis. It's really a myth. Helpful mutations are additionally a myth. Uh, mutations don't even sound good, do they? Uh, when a chromosome breaks, good things don't happen. Um, bad things happen. So the premise that we've had helpful mutations for generation upon generation is ludicrous. I can wait a million billion years and a duck is never going to mature into a porpoise, even though they are both water animals. Um, just so you, you didn't just hear this from me, here's a comment from a highly respected paleontologist. He's in England, 
I wish he was uh, taped because you'd pay more attention to it because it's a British accent. <laughs> okay, uh, but he's, he's been asked a question about the fossil records. He wrote the book called Evolution. Okay, and he's been asked this question and the guy said to him, why didn't you at least include some drawings in there? Here's what he said. Okay, his name is Colin Patterson, Museum of Natural History in Britain. Uh, he says what he said. He says this, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. You suggest that an artist should be asked to visualize such transformations, but where would he get the information from? I could not honestly provide it, and if I were to leave it to artistic license, would that not mislead the reader? Okay, now keep listening to him. Yet Gould and the American Museum people are hard to contradict when they say that there are no transitional fossils. As a paleontologist myself, I'm much occupied with the philosophical problems of identifying ancestral forms in the fossil record. You say that I should at least show a picture, or show a photo of the fossil from which each type organism was derived. This is a great line here, you gotta catch this. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. This is not a Christian, this is an evolutionist. He wrote the book, Evolution. <laughs> now that's really rare. That's like the guy that kind of was my mentor, the, the Russian man, Dr. Dobyshansky. This is a rare bird. This is an evolutionist with integrity. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas. Let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So essentially what we're saying here is no snake ever became a lizard, ever became a mongoose, ever became a bear, none of that. They produce after their own kind. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And here, of course, is a clear statement of the Trinity, because he said, let us make man in our image, the three persons co-equal, co-eternal in one God, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. So these humans are to have dominion now over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and here, man is to be given dominion and even stewardship over the earth and its plants and its animals. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. And you notice that, that man is the only part of creation that's made in the image of God. He's also given stewardship and dominion over others. And he made them male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that's on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit and you shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens 
and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I've given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he'd made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. So let's go ahead and review what some of our findings were from last week, very quickly. Last week we said, here's what we can observe at first glance. This is all in your notes from last week. One is that all creation begins with a creator. That's common sense, isn't it? Only a supernatural creator truly addresses the problem of an ex nihilo, which means from nothing, creation. Romans 4.17 said that God calls into existence the things that do not exist. So in other words, God was the one who made something from nothing. The Holy Spirit was present at creation. We saw that. A gap of billions of years does not appear natural. And then day one resulted in light, dark, night, day, and time. So now we press forward into chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day, made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. It was holy because it was set apart, and because he rested from all other work. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth, and there's the word toledoth, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. Now just an aside there is no rain, and yet there's going to be plants. How's that going to happen? It's this biosphere. That's a closed system with this canopy over it. Actually, more of the waters, we believe, for the general flood, for the global flood, came from underneath than just the rain. Verse 6 says, And a mist, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering, there we are, the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So he moved him from one place to Eden, and out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we know at least there's these two trees that are in the garden that we've been told about. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It's the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, and delium and onyx stone are there. So we've got kind of a an irrigation network going on here to water that area. And we also recognize that they recognize precious metals and gems as well. The name of the second river is Gion, and it's the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, well, we've heard of that, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth, the Euphrates. So this is probably in Mesopotamia, which was part of the ancient uh, Greek empire as well. Today this would be uh, Iraq, Kuwait, uh, part of Syria, the Iran-Iraq border, and the Turkey-Syrian uh, border as well. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you shall surely die. Now we don't know whether that really registered with Adam or not, since 
Did you catch that? Nothing had died to this point. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, everything else was good. Everything else was good and very good. But being alone was not good. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So again, he was not to be alone. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Now, can you imagine Adam at that point saying, what father? What mother? What are you talking about? But God's establishing marriage at this point, isn't he? And a healthy marriage. The healthy marriage is, you've got to get away from your in-laws. <laughs> He's got to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So now let's, let's go through what we've, what we've seen. Uh, let's go ahead and react maybe to what can be observed here in chapter 2. So, uh, one of the things we learn is we honor the Sabbath because God blessed it and made it holy. We honor the Sabbath because God blessed it and made it holy. No other reason. It's to be a day unlike any other day, set apart from other days. Yes, we're supposed to have rest. We're supposed to not be involved in the same work that we're involved in the rest of the week, but we can be involved in the Lord's work. And then note that earth was a biosphere, a self-contained biosphere with a protective canopy. Now, just so I could get uh, credit, I looked at the world's most helpful source, Wikipedia, <laughs> for the definition of biosphere. And you'll see that I just love this definition. And uh, I don't think you'll have to uh, wonder too much which part I don't agree with. The biosphere, this is the definition, the biosphere is the global sum of all ecosystems which is a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. It can also be termed as the zone of life on Earth, a closed system apart from solar and cosmic radiation and heat from the interior of the Earth and largely self-regulating. By the most general biophysical definition, the biosphere is the global ecological system integrating all living beings and their relationships, including their interaction with the elements of the lithosphere, the geosphere, the hydrosphere, and the atmosphere. The biosphere is postulated to have evolved, beginning with a process of biopoasis, life created naturally from non-living matter, such as a simple organic compound, or biogenesis, life created from living matter, at least 3.5 billion years ago. Okay, I don't need to go on much further with that. <laughs> there was a part of that that I agree with. And then he started, what did he start doing? Postulating. Number three, in Genesis 1 and 2, and the uh, man and the animals are all vegetarians. And uh, nothing has died. Nothing has suffered death. Another observation, 
God created man to work and to steward his creation. Man was made in the image of God, the imago dei, image of God, and was made to be in relationship because God is in relationship. It's called the Trinity. Let me go ahead and just suggest some takeaways for us. Some things that we could learn just from the first two. Uh, first, we might ask, does God care about his creation? Well, he seems to care about the very smallest details of his creation, doesn't he? Um, there's order to everything that he's done. And also we can ask, is this really his creation? And that's kind of a, well, it is and it isn't. Remember, chapter 3 is coming up. And that's when sin became a reality for us and the world. And things have changed since God's original design. Well, we can also ask, what has God told me about work? Well, I, I trust that you saw that God made us to appreciate work. What does that say about folks that are always pointing toward retirement? Aren't those the people that die the week after they retire? It seems like, you know, it's just a, such a tragic thing so many times. But what if God, see, what you know what we've done in our culture now? We have... We have made work hell, and retirement we think is heaven. But understand something. Work was given before the fall. God had jobs for Adam before the fall. It's not a result of the fall. The curse on the, on the return of work is a result of the fall, yes. It's a very hot topic in our, in our conversation these days. Um, were men and women created to be complementary or equal in all things? And you know, if you're a feminist, then you're moving toward equal in all things. Um, that's a hot topic. Does that mean that because we're, uh, we're both human that we should put women on the front lines of combat? Um, we're to be helpmates, what we learn here, for each other. Uh, offering love and respect and possessing God-given humility because none of us is better or worthy. Amen? Well, let me stop there. Let me close us in prayer. And let me create a sense of urgency in you for you to read ahead for next week. Um, the problem is sin. And the solution to sin appears for the first time in Genesis chapter 3. So look deeply and find the answer. Let's pray. God, we acknowledge that there are many, many, many things in this world that we have no clue how they work, how they got there. But you do. We thank you that you have opened our eyes, many of us, to see creation around us and to see your hand in creation. And God, we pray that you would do that miracle that only you can do and get your thoughts into our heads. I pray now, Lord, for the sheep here. We know, Lord, that after teaching comes testing. And so I pray for each one here, Lord, that you would embolden them to look people in the eye uh, who perhaps are just citing something that's dangerous to the foundation of a Christian worldview and to say that, uh, no, they don't go along with that, and here's why. So, God, we ask you to use us, frail, finite human beings, mightily for your purpose. For it's in your name we pray.
Amen.